I certainly hope this little incident hasn't put you off flying, miss. Statistically speaking, of course, it's still the safest way to travel. Let's go. But inconspicuously. Through the window. And here we go. What is up, everyone? Welcome to DC Standom, your guided tour of the DC multiverse. It's been a while, but I'm your host, Mike Chikini, the editor-in-chief at DennyGeek.com. And each week, I'm bringing you discussions with writers, artists, actors, and experts covering everything from DC Comics to the movies and TV that make up the DCU. But it's a comics episode this week, and it is a big one because it is my absolute pleasure to be coming to you live because I've got one of my favorite writers ever, and a man who is more in tune with the spirit of the DC universe than just about anybody. I've got Mr. Mark Wade here with us live today. Mark, say hello to everybody. Good evening, sir. How are you this evening? Great to see you. I've been reading your books for as long as I can remember. This is the first time we've ever spoken, so I'm just thrilled to have you here. I'm happy to be here. The first issue of Mark and artist Dan Moore's new Shazam series is out today. And folks, I said I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It is the single best Shazam comic in about 25 years or more. So you should definitely pick it up. Wade and Moore's ongoing Batman Superman World's Finest series is pretty much the platonic ideal of what you want from DC superheroes as well. And we're going to talk about all of it today as well as some exciting new projects on the horizon. Right, Mark? Am I right in saying all this? That is correct, sir. All right, good. But before we get into all this good stuff, you should know that this episode of DC Standom is presented by DC's Justice League Cosmic Chaos. Outright Games and Warner Brothers are calling DC fans of all ages to unite against chaos in the all-new open-world action-adventure game DC's Justice League Cosmic Chaos. Designed to be fun for the whole family, you can play as Batman, Superman, or Wonder Woman to battle the mischievous Mr. Mixus Pitalik, who has summoned Starro the Conqueror and other supervillains to keep the Justice League busy while he becomes the new self-appointed mayor of Happy Harbor. There's other DC heroes in this one, too. Players can also interact with Justice League members like Green Lantern, Cyborg, The Flash, and Aquaman, who all make cameos throughout the game. You can enjoy DC's Justice League Cosmic Chaos with friends and family in two-player instant action couch co-op to engage with the exciting and hilarious gameplay. Justice League Cosmic Chaos is available to play now on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, Xbox XS, and Steam. For more information, head to OutrightGames.com and follow Outright Games on Twitter Instagram, and TikTok for all the latest updates and information on Justice League Cosmic Chaos. And yes, video games are a blast, but let's talk about some comics, shall we? This is a perfect way to get into World's Finest because you talked about having a wish list. Yeah. And like, it's like you start burning through that wish list in the very first issue. I mean, like the first issue alone, there's Metallo, there's Poison Ivy, there's Zodnan and Ursa. There's Luther in his 80s power suit. There's Red Kryptonite. There's all of these concepts that all of them in isolation, any of them can work and any of them are great, right? I can't remember the last time I've seen them all together in something that wasn't explicitly some kind of like big event book where it's like, and now they're all together. So everything's going to be different here. It's just like, no, this is the DC universe, folks. That's that's exactly it. The reason the Doom Patrol is in those first few issues is because we have never seen Batman and the Doom Patrol have an adventure together in 60 years of Doom Patrol. So I thought it's overdue. I want to know what your kind of, I don't know if, if like remit is the right word or mission statement is the right word, but with World's Finest, you know, you're telling stories that are, you know, I guess, you know, in continuity. I like, I know continuity is like a stumbling block for whatever. We'll get to that. But, you know, these are set a few years in the past at a time when you're able to tell characters in kind of their most iconic versions, right? So was that part of what drew you to the book? 
I mean, it feels like it had been a while since you had done a DC ongoing as as well. So how how, how important was that element of it like to draw you back in? That was an, a huge important element. And it's not because I have an affinity for older comics, Silver Age, Bronze Age, stuff like that. I do, but those comics exist. They have a place. This is not an attempt to recreate that stuff. But the beauty of being able to step back a few years is that we are not beholden to what is happening in the Superman books right this second, what's happening in the Batman books right this second, trying to get all those things coordinated so that it's all one seamless present day DC universe. This gives us a chance to sort of form our own little pocket so that we can set things up that will spill over into the main DC universe. And we're going to do that with every arc as near as I can, as near as I can plan uh, to make it clear that it's set in the past, but it is connected. And there is a reason for you to read this book because there are origins here of things that will be big in the DC universe in 2023 and 2024. Like I had no idea. I read Batman versus Robin late. Okay. Like full disclosure, folks, I did not read Batman versus Robin until I was prepping for this interview. And what a mistake that was because, you know, the, 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 it was a Mahmoud Asrar on that book. Yeah. Like, like it was fantastic as well. But I love that, you know, the first arc of World's Finest is completely standalone on its own. But if you read that, it enriches everything that happens in Batman versus Robin, which, of course, then sets up Lazarus Planet and which is, you know, setting new status quo in the DCU. So you're kind of getting to play with all the toys, even even if you're very firmly like, you know, I feel in your wheelhouse with World's Finest and Shazam. Yeah, I feel, I, it's the best of every world for me. I get to write in that era. I get to write, as you say, the classic versions of the characters, the iconic versions that we're all familiar with. But the key to making it a book that still matters, if you will, even though it sets it takes place in the, in the past, is that we are setting things up for the main DC universe. And that's part of the goal of every arc, to be a standalone, but have threads that can then spill out into Shazam, spill out into other books, spill out you know, throughout the DC universe. When you were first brought back for World's Finest, at one point did Dan Mora come into the picture? Because this book is great, but it's just, it's just greater because it's, it's Dan Mora. Dan is Dan is amazing. One of my favorite things about Dan, besides his storytelling, besides the fact that the pages are beautiful and impactful, is that I will often send him reference on Bronze Age stuff that, you know, suits, costumes, characters, or whatever, and tell him, look, some of this stuff looks a little outdated. Feel free to punch it up. Feel free to muck around with it a little bit and and do what you mean. And every time it comes back just exactly the way it used to look, and yet it somehow has some sort of Dan Moore touch on it that makes it look like the now, makes it look contemporary. It's amazing. His Batman is just unreal. Just the little detail of like, it's the Batman 89 movie logo on the chest, you know, like it's it's the the way the utility belt looks. It's the lines on that Robin costume are unbelievable. <laughs> like it just... Like, it's definitely pushing all of my buttons as a kid who grew up in the 80s and had superpowers action figures, but it also feels completely contemporary. Right. That's the goal. That's the goal. And, and without Dan, I don't know where I'd be on that. And Tamara Bonvillain, we should mention, is the colorist there. And with Shazam, Alejandro Sanchez, colorist, who also makes Dan look really good. So uh, it's a team effort. I mean, it's I've made it clear all along. This is not you know they're not i don't want to work with an art robot i want to work with somebody who's going to be an actual participant in the storytelling and bring their own heat and all the people on these teams do this does any of this change your tone like as you're getting pages back you know do you start thinking about how you know that might impact future issues like are you then changing um i don't know just the way you want to present certain characters, especially as you're bringing in new folks, like when the key and the Joker show up, it's just, it's right. just out of control. 
yeah, sometimes I'll see characters that Dan just thrown in there and I will say, okay, he really needs to draw a firestorm more or what have you. I mean, it's just, it's, it's always a pleasant surprise to see him take on any of the DC characters and villains because there's something about the way he interprets all of them that you want to use all of them. You know, Hypertime, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like it wasn't particularly well received at the time. Oh, there, that's, that's a way of putting it, yes. Um, it, but now, <laughs> like it's kind of, it's time has come, right? It seems am, like it's almost by default even before this book has kind of just kind of crept into storytelling is like the natural logic of everything. And not to break my arm and pat myself on the back, but I think if you look at my history uh, in comics, you'll see that there've been many times I've been ahead of my time and done, doing stuff that nobody was paying attention to. But then a little while later, hey, this actually, there's something here. And that's kind of flattering, actually. It's, it's nice to feel like you've done something, contributed something to the DC universe or to your favorite characters that gets carried on by other people. It has legs. It feels like you've actually added something to the mythos. And Hypertime was a really good example of that. It wasn't terribly well received at the time, but now, yeah, it's the foundation of a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm not sure I could even explain Hypertime, you know, it's, but it's I just- really, It's really simple. Everything happened. That's somewhere out yeah. there, everything happened. That's all it is. It's basically just- okay. You know, a way, uh, another way of framing parallel worlds. It is the thing that all of the stories you ever read in DC history happen somewhere, someplace, sometime. That's all. That's all hyper time ever was. Well, it's working now, and like I feel like World's Finest is a book that just kind of, even without it being articulated, is just like applying that hyper time logic because it is like just the, the perfect versions of all these characters. I know we only have another couple minutes with you, so I kind of want to do a lightning round, if that's okay. Let's do it. Is there a DC work that you are most proud of? It's a tie between Kingdom Come and Birthright. I am Superman Birthright is maybe one of my favorite things I ever wrote. I know that your upcoming Superman work is going to potentially call back to elements of Birthright. Is that correct? That's correct. Superman, The Last Days of Lex Luthor, which is sort of a semi-sequel to Birthright. It's not, you know, you don't have to read one to read the other. It's not necessarily a continuance of the story, but it's the interpretation of Luther, the interpretation of Superman that you see in Last Days of Lex Luthor. If you read Birthright, that'll be very familiar to you. You have done two Legion reboots, um, right? The, yes. Three, I, counting, three counting being the editor of the five years later, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but five years later, is like that's like a soft reboot, right? But like you've done two back-to-the-start Legion reboots. Yep. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite between the two of them, or is that like picking your favorite child? No, my favorite is the is the more recent one, the two thousand five one with Barry Kitson. That was that really felt like we were able to get under the hood and really take that book and that mythos apart and put it back together in a way that was respectful but was very modern. And I I'm very happy with the way it turned out. I mean, it lasted a good long time by you know current comic standards. And I, you know, as, as interesting as the Archie Legion was, is what the other thing was, the reboot before that, I'm much happier with this. I Look, I love them both. I feel like the later one would have been even more successful. I think it was, I think it, once again, I think you were ahead of your time on that. I think the radicalism of that one would have landed even better five or six years later. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. I do think it tonally and with the things we were dealing with sociologically, I think we were ahead of our time. Yeah. Like I revisited that, you know, at the start of the, uh, <clears throat> the bad years right. uh, and <laughs> like, and it, and it hit different. Like it really yeah. hit different. I mean, like I always enjoyed it. You can't go wrong with Barry Kitts and art. Right. Um, right. No, of course. Yeah. But the revolutionary spirit of that book, uh, I think, I think people, are just like primed to rediscover. I, I don't know. I don't know why they haven't already. What are your memories? Because one of my favorite, most treasured single issues of all time is the Flash 50th anniversary special. Uh, That's nice. Like that just, yeah. Like that was before I knew who you were. You know what I mean? Like that was probably, might've been the first thing of yours I ever read. 
but it was just something that when it came out, it just felt like this amazing thing that was just kind of mine, you know? Where do you, do you, do you have particularly fond memories of that? Do you think, you know, John Fox is a character that needs to come back? I'm really curious just about, yeah. about this yeah. story. I mean, it just means a lot to me personally. It, the reason it worked is because it wasn't an assignment. I mean, it, it was, but it wasn't, it felt like an assignment. It was, we have to pour one out for editor Brian Augustine, my late friend who passed away last year. And he, he was the editor of Flash and the guiding light of Flash at that time. He loved the Flash. I loved the Flash. So it was an anniversary issue done by people who really, really, really loved that, that character. And we had Bill Loeb's, we had uh, Len Trzewski. It was a good team on that book. You're known as a Wally writer, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like you did that amazing run on Wally. Do you have a Barry run in you? God, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I I took a bite of that apple with Brave and Bold, Flash and Green Lantern, back with which I love Barry Kitson back in the day, back in, in some time ago, which is still in print, by the way. All this stuff's still in print, by the way. Go to your local comic store. Um, I I probably do, but uh, it'll be a while before we get around to that. Well, folks, that is it for this week's DC Standup. We will be back soon. I promise. I don't know that we'll have a guest as cool as Mark Wade but I'll see what no. I can do. Don't forget to check out our web home, DennyGeek.com. You can find all our DC coverage at DennyGeek.com slash DC. Drop us a line on Twitter and Instagram. We are at DC Standom. Let us know what you want to hear about in upcoming episodes. Uh, give us a follow, you know the drill. And thanks again to our sponsor, Outright Games and Justice League Cosmic Chaos. Head over to OutrightGames.com for more info on that fun new game. Don't forget to check out our Marvel show. This Friday, we're doing a live stream about the amazing Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And uh, I think that's it for this episode. But this has been DC stand on the Denny Network. Until next time, remember, folks, we stand together. <laughs>